be here today. Glad to see you all and uh, hope you've been praying for your pastor. Amen. And Miss Karen, I know they appreciate it and Aaron and Erica and everything. I know you're going to be missing them, but I'm glad you're here today and uh, always tell people I'm just a cheap substitute. You need to come hear the real, the real thing. Amen. And uh, you got a good pastor, faithful pastor. Was he been here 25 years now? Something like that. And uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Hmm, that would be a thought to remember as well and take care of him. And uh, appreciate the uh, introduction there, brother, and everything. But look at Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. And uh, I want to go over uh, this morning and give you some things about how to break out of a rut. You know, everybody gets in a rut sometimes. And... Uh, yeah, you can't help it, I guess. And so uh, sometimes you can't, and, uh, but you don't want to stay in a rut. Uh, nobody wants to stay in that uh, predicament. It's not a good situation. Someone said a rut is a grave with both ends kicked out, you know. And uh, I'd read this, that a rut is produced when the weight of an object presses heavy and it's harder than the surface on which the rut is made. And so you think about that just a little bit. And uh, it, just, just saying that you, know, you run a wagon down a road that's muddy, the hard surface of the wagon wheel and the weight of the wagon wheel is going to press into it. And so we're all going to go through times of, I won't say depression, but uh, it could be that, and discouragement and despondency and and some of that, but you don't want to stay in that predicament, amen? And by God's grace and by God's will, you don't have to, amen? And I don't have to, so uh, we definitely want to learn to be in the right place and uh, get our hearts right and keep them right. And so look at this story, if you would, over here in the book of Mark chapter number 10, and we're going to start in verse number 46. An old fellow here by the name of Bartimaeus. Old blind Bartimaeus. And, uh, you know, people like to categorize people, don't they? And here he is, he's blind. And his name is Bartimaeus. And so um, he had a condition that's kind of like a, talk about having some mental problems. I was reading about a guy, you know, he's passing by a, a mental institution. And... Uh, he said he kept hearing everybody yelling, 13, 13, 13, 13. They kept yelling, 13. And he's wondering, what are they doing? It's a big old picket fence. And so he went up where there's a knot hole so he could kind of look in there and he put his eye up that knot hole and then someone poked him in the eye with something. And man, he went like that and they all started saying, 14, 14, 14, amen. And so uh, anyway kind of like another institution, a fellow was going and uh, had, uh, you know, he's, he's going, he heard somebody kept saying, I am Napoleon, I am Napoleon, I am Napoleon. And somebody said, well, how do you know you're Napoleon? And he said, God told me I'm Napoleon. God told me that. And uh, right down the hall, someone else yelled out, I did not. All right, so anyway, you, you get all kinds, amen? And so, but look at this blind Bartimaeus chapter number uh, 10 of Mark, verse 46. It says, and they came to Jericho, and as they went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the wayside begging. I always liked that term begging. Uh, heard about a preacher who, I think it was actually Spurgeon. He said that when he, D.L. Moody or Spurgeon, one of those two that said, when I die, they, they, uh, they're going to put on my uh, headstone, my, the epitaph on my headstone. It's going to say, and it came to pass that the beggar died. The beggar died. They said they'd get a meeting somewhere and they'd pass a hat around every time he'd turn around, taking up an offering. But we don't ever want to be that way as uh, Christians, do we? Anyway, verse 47, and, and when they had heard that it was Jesus, when he had heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried 
the more, a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And I like these next three words. Jesus stood still. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and went to Jesus. Or, or, I'm sorry, and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Now you'd think it'd be obvious, wouldn't you, that uh, he'd already know what he... He needed. But God wants you to ask, by the way. And a lot of times everybody just pray, I just pray God's will be done, God's will be done, God's will be done. But you know, uh, here's the Lord said, what will thou that I should do unto thee? I think it's a good thing to always just say, you know, I would like to receive Messiah, Lord. If that be your will, that's what I would like. And uh, if, if that be your will as well, praise the Lord. And, uh, but to sit there and just say, I'm going to just see what God does. I think uh, God's sometimes waiting to hear from you to get what you really want and what you really need. Uh, I just read this morning that no good, good, no good thing will he withhold from them that love him. Amen. You know, and if you trust him and you love him and you serve him, then uh, I, I don't think he's going to withhold things from you that are good. And it says, the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. We ought to be following him in the way too, shouldn't we? All the time. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Amen. And so let's pray. Father God, again, thank you for today. And thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies and Lord, your grace that is all sufficient. And Lord, for your mercy and for your love. And Lord, just for your care for us and your presence that is always with us. And Lord, your promise that we're two or three are gathered together in my name there, am I in the midst of them. And Lord, that you walk in the midst of the seven churches. Thank you that right now, Lord, your presence is here right now. We ask for it. I ask you to be here in Jesus' name, Lord. And God, empower us and help us and give strength to those might right now that might be in a rut. They might have just fallen into some rut and they need to get out of it. I pray for divine help and healing or whatever they need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. All right. Well, let's look at this, how to break out of a rut. All right. How to break out of a rut. And I think it might be helpful to you. And let's uh, look at verse number 47 again. Uh, here it says... And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. A lot of people said, hey, you need to be quiet. But you know what? He, you know what he did? He resumed responsibility for his own life. He assumed responsibility for his own life. And that's the first step you're going to have to do is quit blaming everybody else. You know, he could have said, well, nobody wants me to get there. Nobody cares about me. I'm sitting over here begging, and they're all telling me to be quiet. And so we must assume responsibility for our own life and our own actions and whatever it is that we need to do. We need to take the first step. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. You find it all through the Bible. But to sit back and do nothing, means you're going to just stay in a rut. You're going to stay down. You're going to stay depressed. You're going to stay discouraged or disheartened or whatever uh, you might be going through right now in your life. And like I said, we all go through it. Nothing wrong going through it. Uh, you just need to sometimes get lifted up. Elijah went through it. Remember when he said he wanted to die? Moses went through it one time. He, he wanted to die as well and uh, asked God to just take his own life. They weren't worthy. And so they go through it, but they didn't stay there. And it's not right to stay in a rut, amen? And this man had been in a rut for a long time, a long time. He was born blind, and so, but he assumed responsibility for his own life, amen? He began to cry out. And I know people, they'll blame their parents for things. 
I blame my daddy. I blame my mama. I blame my brother. I blame my sister. I blame people that when I was a kid at school and they'd said this stuff to me. Or I blame, you know, they just blame everybody, you know. And uh, we was talking the other day about getting whippings, and I thought, man, I got my fair share. I'm 55 when I was in fifth grade, and I got, I think, 10 when I was in sixth grade. In junior high, I got quite a few and got kicked out and a few things. But uh, I had a teacher take me in the hallway and just whip me. I mean, just seventh grade, bent me right over and whipped me and held me, you know, and whipped me. And, uh, but I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell nobody. Uh, in gym class, if, if you didn't hang your clothes up when you suited up for PE, if someone knocked your clothes off the hanger, you got a you got a swat, and the and the, the coach had a baseball bat that he had shaved down through a planer, and he put a, a red stripe down it. Those are school colors anyway, and I mean he uh, he lifted me off the ground with that thing, and and I thought I didn't even knock, but I never held it against the coach about that. I didn't tell my parents. But, you know, everybody blames everybody for everything. And, and we ought not be doing that. Amen? We, we need to assume responsibility. You know, I, I, I had some, probably some patterns I maybe didn't deserve, but there's a lot more I should have had. You know, a lot more I should have had. And there's some they wanted to give me, and I didn't take them. So, uh, but uh, when I got a little bit bigger. But the, the fact was is uh, don't blame your parents. Don't blame the environment. Uh, that's what a lot of people do today. What these people are doing, they're robbing and stealing stuff because the environment in which they live and this and that. Uh, poverty, that's not an excuse either. People during the Great Depression didn't go out doing all this stuff, rooting and looting and burning and rioting and stealing everything like that. You know, people work hard in those days and they saved and they didn't have big screen televisions and all these mega these phones that's got everything and computers in their hand they didn't have all that but they know how to survive some people blame the circumstances of their life uh, disabilities whatever it might be I can't do this I can't do that and surely we, we, we go through different times. You know, I've been a few, few, through, few surgeries and things like that. And just had one recently. I got a tube hanging out right here in the front of me, bandaged up right here right now. So I don't know, bump this pulpit too hard. It does hurt when I do that. But you know what? But everybody's got, everybody just blames everything. And we have to assume responsibility for our own lives. And by the way, you need to do the same thing with your children. Uh, sometimes people, uh, you just keep funding your children and funding your children and funding your children, enabling your children and able to them never to grow up and never to resume responsibility uh, or assume responsibility for their own life. And so I'm just saying this, blind Bartimaeus, he just had to assume his own responsibility. He was the one that was blind. He's the one that needed help and he needed to get over to him. Amen? And so... Um, uh, j just that fact, uh, 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 Sam Jones was at one time was a lawyer and he got into drunkenness and uh, become a drunkard. And uh, every morning he'd go to the bar and come in the back and sleep in the alley, come in the bar, and they would give him all the busted liquor, what they call busted. But, you know, at the end of the night, all the drinks left over, they just pour it in the thing when they would wait the tables and they would save all that leftover from everybody's drinking and that's what he would drink. When he got up in the morning, he said he was sitting at the bar and he was looking in the mirror at himself and his beard matted and had vomit and things like that on it. We'd been laying outside and he was drinking that and, and he looked at himself in the mirror and he started crying out, Oh God, oh God, what happened to the old Sam Jones? And they said he went and got him a room somewhere, stayed there for several days and come out a changed man. Went back to his home. His wife was afraid to open the door because he had beat her so many times. Sam Jones said, Honey, you've got a, you got a new husband. you got a new husband. And you know what he had to do? Assume responsibility for his own life. Assume responsibilities for his own life. I know people that are drunkards and they'll blame it on some circumstance in their life. Uh, I had a man that was a, a record driver. I met him. He was a drunk at the time. 
And uh, I'd met him, and I tried to witness him about the Lord, and, and uh, he was explaining, well, why he's a drunk. And he said that one time he got called on a record call, and there was somebody under the car, and, and, you know, and they were trying to get the car lifted up. And so he had backed up, and he said he kind of didn't think a lot because he dealt with some of that so much. But he said when he raised up the car, he realized it was his own son. Wow. And his own son had, was dead, had his head. Anyway, he was, uh, and so he had that bottle. And he was saying, you know, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I thought, well, you know, how long ago was that? And I know it's a terrible thing. It's a tragic thing. We all go through those things that life's weeping way. You know, I've seen the death of so many in my family and, and, and so on and been to so many other families when they've lost loved ones and watch them go through that. And it's all right to grieve and it's all right to be hurt. It's all right to experience pain. It's all right for that. But it shouldn't go on and on and on for the rest of your life where you're crippled and you're disabled mentally and emotionally and spiritually. Uh, you got to move on, you know. You're going to have to assume responsibility for your own life. Oh, blind Bartimaeus, that's what he did, you know. You know, uh, Job didn't blame anybody. When he went through, lost his ten children, he lost his farm and all of his animals, his livestock, his servants, and got sick, and then his wife said, curse God and died. And, and uh, you know what the Lord said? that He said, naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He never did. A lot of people, they get angry at God. You know what? And they fail to resume responsibility uh, for their own life. Uh, the second thing I want you to notice here, look at verse 51. And that is where he said, verse 51, he says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And what, what's the second thing you ought to be doing uh, if you're in that situation? And that is this. And that is for you to believe that you can change. Uh, notice the second part of that verse he said um, and the blind man said Lord that I might receive my sight so I'm saying this he had to believe that he could change you can't help a drunkard or a drug addict or anybody that's got a problem if they don't believe they can change even people that have financial difficulties and financial struggles you can't really help them out if they don't believe that they can make a correction themselves, call budgeting and some of that and get control of their finances and get control of their own life, you're going to have to believe that you can change. Of course, that the Lord can help you, but that you can change. Uh, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You know what? He just said it. Paul said, I can do all things through him. And through Christ, we can do it. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So God said this, you call on me, I'll show you great and mighty things. You just need to believe that you can change. You know? And most people don't like changing. Change is kind of a hard thing. But the fact is, is... Uh, you can do it. Heard about the way they do elephants. They say that when they would get an elephant and they would drive a, a stake, like a four-foot stake in the ground, put a chain around it, tied around that elephant's front leg or hind leg, and they would just leave it on the elephant. Every time he tried to pull, he realized, I can't pull this out. He just keeps pulling. Can't pull this out. I can't move this thing. Can't move it. And so uh, what happens? Then... Um, the elephant finally gets so ingrained in his mind that he can't move it. They said later they can just put him somewhere, put a little two-inch stake in the ground, tie the chain around him, and he won't even try to pull anymore. And a lot of people like that. They quit trying to change. They quit trying to pull. They just so convinced, I can't change. Was it was that song back in the 60s, I Can't Change, or 70s, whenever it came out? Uh... Free bird, I think it was called, or something. It is a lot about drugs. I can't change. Lord help me, I can't change. I can't change. That's basically, the whole song, it seemed like that's what it said. can't remember how it goes. Glad I don't. But, but that's what he would say. I can't change. I can't change. And uh, well, if you can convince yourself that, you're never going to change. But you're going to have to believe that you can. All right? Because you can. 
And God will give you the grace. And God will give you the strength. And God can change your family. Man, God can deliver your children from drugs, from alcohol, from whatever addiction that they may have. God can change them and God can deliver them. And so that's why the Bible says everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to let your requests be made known unto God. And so we want to pray about everything. But why? Because we want to believe that God can change these things, all right? And God can change anything in your life if you look at it that way, amen, and uh, realize it. Heard about a lady and a man, they were working at uh, some factory somewhere, and, and the lady was kind of tired that day, and she told the man, she said, you know, I bet you I can get the boss to let me go home early today, take the day off. And uh, he said, oh, yeah? She said, yeah. And so she said, you just watch this when the boss comes by. So when she saw the boss was kind of coming her way, she jumped up on one of the rafters and she started hanging herself upside down, you know, from, from knees hooked over and her head hanging down. The boss came by and said, what are you doing? What are you doing hanging upside down? She said, I'm a light bulb. And the boss said, man, you've been working too hard, lady. You, need it. you can take the rest of the day off. And so she jumped down, started heading out the door. And that guy, her co-worker, started walking right behind her. He's leaving too. And the boss said, where do you think you're going? He said, I'm going home too. I can't work in the dark. So uh, anyway, all right. Hey, you got to believe you can change, amen? And believe you can get off work if you need to. That's at least one idea for you there. All right, uh, let me get the third thing here out of this passage that I think is, is very uh, helpful and that is found in verse 51. And um, we need to clarify what we really need. All right? Now, I know God knows, but ask God, Lord, put it in my heart to pray, to know how to pray, and do those things. And so you help me with this, Lord. Clarify what you really need. Verse 51, here's what he says. And Jesus said unto him, What wilt thou, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? So, he asked him, he said, what do you want me to do? And that's where I mentioned Philippians 4, 6. He said, let your request be made known unto God. Let your request. And so on your prayer list, you ought to have a, you know, a list of things that you're requesting from God. Now, unless God's outright said no, you want to keep asking. You want to keep asking. You want to keep asking. And don't be afraid to ask. All right? A lot of times, you know, we, we uh, heard about some beggars on the street corner. And they're, they're kind of begging, doing their thing. And uh, they were griping, you know, several of them. And they were griping. And then one of them said, met that $100, I'd never gripe again. I got a $100 bill, I'd never gripe again. And about that time, there's a businessman kind of walking by. And he heard that. And he said, sir, did I hear you say that if you had $100, you'd never gripe again? And the guy said, sure, yeah. And he reached in, handed him a $100 bill, and left. And then the old beggar said, man, I should ask for $200, you know. And so I, you know, a lot of times people are never satisfied, and they just want to gripe and complain. But the fact is, is we need to let our requests be made unto God. We need to beg. We need to plead. But we need to clarify exactly what we need. The Lord said, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? So, um, you know. Have you got a prayer list? Amen. Do you have things, you know, delineated, laid out, line by line? Do you have that? And uh, or do you let those requests be made on a regular basis? And so if not, you know, you need to do that. You need to clarify what he would have you to do. Uh, God asked Solomon that uh, in night to come to him and said, uh, you know, I, I wanna, I've heard your prayer, and they said, I, I, I want to answer your prayer. He said, well, what would you want? And Solomon said, well, he said, I need an understanding heart. I need wisdom to guide these people. He said, I'm just like a child. I don't know how to go out and come in. I don't know how to do anything, Lord. I need wisdom and understanding. And the Lord said, you know, I'm going to give you that. 
And because you didn't ask for wealth and you didn't ask for the lives of your enemy and you didn't ask for long life and these things, he said, because you've done that, he said, I'm going to give you those also. And he ended up being the richest man, uh, as far as we know, that probably ever lived, at least up to that time, and just a tremendous thing. But you know what? You need to clarify what you really want. You need to clarify what you really need. That's what you got to do. Uh, what does James say? You have not because you ask not. not. That's right. So, you know what? A lot of times I think God wants to give you something, but you don't ask. And it might be here in America that we already have so much. You know, we don't have to pray, this, give us this day our daily bread because you probably got bread. And you probably got a refrigerator full of food, maybe a freezer full of food, maybe also a big refrigerator or freezer full of food and canned goods in a pantry, and I don't know, maybe you don't have anything. Whatever the case is, give us this day our daily bread. And in those days, it was a daily struggle. They didn't have a way to preserve things like we do today. They could do some th pr preservation, but not like we all the equipment we have today and stuff that we can do. But I'm just saying to clarify what you really need and do it on a regular basis, Amen. And uh, yeah, you want to ask God. And you know what God can do? God can meet your needs. Let me just ask you that. Do you have a regular time that you pray? Do you have a regular time that you talk to the Lord? Or you got, you know, maybe you got enough money, you don't have to worry about it. You got money in the bank, you got this, you got that. But, uh, you know, we need to know what it is to, to pray and trust the Lord. And, uh, you know, there's other people that struggle in life and they might have a better prayer life, amen? And you've been blessed with a job, but uh, it's, it's definitely, uh, you want to be in your prayer, prayer closet. Let me do the fourth thing. Let's just move on here real quick. And that is uh, down in verse number 40, I think it's verse 48. I got to get my glasses on to see that. Verse 48, here's what he says there. And many charged them that he should hold his peace. Many charged him that he should hold his peace. Uh, this, something had to happen to me before I could get saved, and that is stop worrying about what other people are going to say. Stop worrying about what other people are going to say. Everybody's telling them, be quiet. Be quiet. That's the master over here, and you're disturbing everything he's trying to say. Hey, don't worry about what other people are going to be saying about you. But you know, a lot of people, they can't do anything. They're afraid of what someone's going to say to, about them. And we ought not be fearful of whatever's going to happen or whatever somebody's going to say. But a lot of people, they live in that constant fear, that constant worry that if I say something, if I say that, uh, and I'll tell you, this is going to be a future event. Uh, I don't know how long it'll be, probably not real long. If you ever say that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, there is no heaven but the way through Christ. There, you know, without him, you're gonna, you'll spend eternity lost. There's not many religions. There's one religion. There, there's one true God. And you've got to go through Jesus Christ. And there's no other way than you're going to be deemed a, you know, hater and all this kind of stuff today uh, because you say he's the only way. Back in the 60s, it was a big thing at one time. Remember, one way. Remember that? You had the big finger. One way. Everybody, one way. And it was like, not really a problem back then, but it will be in the future. Because when you say that, you're saying there's not an Islamic way or there's not a, a Buddhist way and not a Confucius way or not all these different Hinduism and, and all this stuff. No, there is only one way. It's through Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, it's not hate speech. We're just stating the fact. And that's what the Bible says. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. Amen. And so there's no other way of salvation. There's no other book. There's no other book. And so uh, that it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing, even inviting asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and, and a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. So I'm saying this, stop worrying about what other people are going to say. Many charge him that he should hold his peace. Now, uh, 
It's all right to admit our inadequacies and to, and to confess our failures and our faults. But the fact is, is we need to stop worrying about what everybody, everybody else has to say about it. Your religion's wrong. Don't be forcing your religion down my throat. And we're not to force them. You just talk to people about Jesus. They think you're forcing it down their throat. And you're not. But I'm saying stop worrying about what people are going to say. You know, let people know you're praying for them. Let people know you love them. Let people know you care about them. Uh, especially during this time when everybody's isolated and separated and, and there's not much. Uh, I know when this thing first started, we were over in uh, Alma doing a missions conference and it was just kind of, you know, they're shutting everything down. And, and uh, this is in March. And so I finished that meeting. I had to go directly to another meeting in Oklahoma, and it was shutting down over there too. So people was getting a little, little, little afraid. And uh, but you know, we we just uh, kept right on, kept right on going. We never missed a meeting. I had a, I had did have some that canceled a little bit later on, but I thought you know I'm not gonna let something stop me. You know, I'm not gonna let something stop me. And so I know, you know, I've been in churches where it's really strict, and that's all right. I've been in churches not so strict, and that's all right. And so, uh, you know, preached up a meeting a few weeks ago up in uh, uh, Stone County area, and, and one of the preachers had had uh, COVID. Another preacher that was there had had COVID, and one of the men, his wife, had had COVID. And, but they didn't have it then. And uh, so I, I don't know. I just hadn't worried about it. And the Lord has watched over me. I'm not saying I'm not going to have it next week. Amen. But uh, uh, I've been, God's been good. God's been good. Uh, I know what I was thinking about. They were saying that you're older and I'm 64. We got 17 grandkids and I got diabetes and I got high blood pressure and I've got all these different things and about to go on dialysis and all that. But I thought, you know, I'd rather die than I would not see my grandkids. So I've seen every one of them, you know, and hugged them all and seen some yesterday and swing them in the uh, port swing and um, a little thing hanging from a tree and, and just spend time with them and love on them and hug them all. And, and I just do that. I don't know. Uh, I'd far rather have, have that love than I would not have it. But I'm saying this, just stop worrying about what people say. If you're a church and you got really, uh, uh, you know, you're doing it all in the parking lot, don't worry about people criticize you for it. Or if you're going to all online, don't let people criticize. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about what they're saying. Or if you're having all your services. I've been to some that uh, they do Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. They do every service. They never miss, never shut anything down. Uh, uh, they shake hands. They hug. They do all that. And, and that's fine. You know, I'm just saying don't worry, don't worry about what the veil says, you know. You're Liberty Baptist Church, Searcy, Arkansas, and, and uh, you got your pastor and you're following his leadership, and you do what you know is right or what you feel is right in the way you want to do things. We're all, what we say, independent. We're not trying to run each other's life and uh, other churches' lives, that is. And so uh, stop worried about what other people think. Amen? And, uh, and if you want to break out of a rut, that's one of the best things you can do, quit worrying about what other people are going to say. You're going to have to, you know, because uh, people are going to drag you down. People are going to put you down, and especially during this uh, toxic political environment that we're in, you know. And politics is not necessarily religion. To some people it is, but don't let that be a dividing factor in your family. Uh, don't let that divide your family. It's not worth it. Amen. It's really not. I always hated this time, uh, pl uh, the election year, because uh, when I've been a pastor, you know, you sometimes you think, say things and then you lose people. And I thought, well, the election's over, and now uh, we've lost people because of my mouth. And so I always try to be careful what I say. And you have the entitled to believe anything you want to believe as long as you're in line with me. All right? I'm, and I'm, kid, I'm kidding about that. But, uh, but stop worrying about what other people are going to say. All right? Stop worrying about what other people are going to say. And then uh, uh, number five, let me give you the fifth one here. And that is... Uh, Stop waiting for the ideal circumstances. Man. Stop waiting for the ideal circumstances. Look, if you would, at verse number... Um, well, really, if you go back to the very first verse here, let me get these glasses on again. But he says in uh, verse 46, And they came to Jericho, and they went, by, uh, went 
And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the wayside begging. It wasn't probably the best. He didn't have his Sunday best clothes on, did he? Not that I know. He'd be sitting there in beggar's clothes. If you're going to be out begging, you want to wear probably, surely not your best clothes. You don't want to be out in, in all your fancy suit and stuff begging. You got to make yourself look as poor as you can. And he probably needed to uh, to survive. And being blind, I'm sure that was something. But I'm saying this, stop waiting for the ideal circumstances. A lot of people that, well, I'm waiting. As soon as I get things right, as soon as I quit smoking, as soon as I quit drinking, as soon as I get over my drugs, I'm going to come to Jesus. Uh, that's probably not going to work very good. You just need to come to him. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And uh, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and you shall find rest unto your soul. And I'm just saying this. You know, we need to get right to him. Quit waiting for ideal circumstances, and that's what everybody's always waiting for. I'm waiting for everything just to be just right. And a lot of times that happen, never happens. A lot, lot of couples are waiting for the ideal circumstance to go get marriage counseling or talk to the preacher or whatever they're going to do to try to get help. Uh, you, better get it when you, you better get it when you need it. Yes. You might not feel right now is the best time, but you need to get it. Or you're not going to break out of the rut that you've been in in your marriage and in your life. Stop waiting for the ideal circumstance, and so, as so many people do. If you think about Nehemiah, when he went to go build the wall, it was a hostile environment. Man, Symbolic, Tobiah, the Arabian, all the, and all the evil stuff they said about them and the threatened them and, and the lies they sent out about them and, and uh, you know, everything they want to do that the men are trying to work, at, they got a trial in one hand trying to build and the other saying they got a sword, you know. And so they're building and battling at the same time. The enemies are saying anything you build, uh, uh, if the you know fox go up, it'll break down your stone wall. So uh, just all the criticism, all of that, uh, everybody's waiting for the, the perfect time. He goes there, all the walls of the city are burnt. All the walls are broken down. The gates are burnt with fire. The walls are broken down. The people are in shambles. Most of the people have been carried away into Babylon. Assyria and Babylon, and then uh, and here they are um, waiting for the perfect situation. And uh, you just need to you, you need to break out of that rut. Amen. Quit waiting for the perfect circumstances because most likely it's never going to come. You know when Jesus came, they were killing the babies. Everywhere he went, they followed him and heckled him. They accused him, lied about him. They called him the Nazarene. Man, you know, he was not a Nazarene. We sing that song sometimes of G Jesus the Nazarene, but uh, he, that was a derogatory term. He was not a Nazarene. He was a Bethlehemite. He was born in Bethlehem. Now, he was of Nazareth because he moved there with his father and his mother. And, uh, but so he was of, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, but they said this Nazarene, they were criticizing the fact that he was of Nazareth and not necessarily, they didn't think he was of Bethlehem. And then they also said, we be not born of fornication when he's arguing with them. And they said, your mother uh, got pregnant before she was married. We be not born of fornication like you were. Ah, you're eating with publicans and sinners, you know. They always had something, didn't they? And so uh, I'm just saying, stop waiting for ideal circumstances. You're going to change. You need to break out of a rut. Man, you, you, you need to get on it. Amen. Uh, God will take care of you. I think of Stephen, one of the first deacons. And as uh, he was out preaching, and man, they got mad and they stoned him. Remember that? He's the one that. 
as he spoke, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on them with their teeth, started biting them. And then they took them and stoned them. Uh, Saul was there, the, later the apostle Paul, and he was consenting unto his death. And Stephen looked up and he said, I see heavens open and I see the, you know, the, the, the son of man you know, sitting on God's right hand. And uh, as they stoned him, man, he was calling on the name of the Lord. And I'm saying this, you know, uh, God, no matter what you got to go through, God will help you. Yes. If we're going to have to die a martyr's death for him, God will give you the grace you're going to need. Did you know that? Everything it seemed like I've been through in my life, uh, some of the most difficult times, you often wonder, how am I going to get through that? And that's because of the grace of God. His grace is sufficient. All sufficient grace. Look at, look, look, we look at number six. Look at number six here real quick. That's found in verse number 50. And he casting away his garment. And I'm just saying this. uh, Do something bold and dramatic if need be. Get on the altar. Tell the preacher, I'm going to rededicate my life. Or I want you to pray about something. I'm going to give up this. I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to quit whatever uh, uh, could be in your life or going on. Probably something I hadn't even named. Maybe they need to get back to praying, whatever it is. But I'm just saying this. Do something bold and dry. He threw away his garment. You know, if you've got a people everywhere, one of the last things you want to do is take your clothes off. But I don't know if he just had like a rug hanging over him or a big quilt or if the, or what. But whatever his garment was, he cast it away so there was nothing hindering him to get to Jesus. And we don't want anything to hinder us from getting to Jesus. Nothing. You know, we sing it. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, naught of this world's delusive dreams. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. There's nothing between. What do you have to cast off to get to Jesus? Before I was saved, I had to cast off some friends, people I grew up with all my life, get away from them to get my life to the Lord. And uh, I had to do it. So I'm just saying, what's holding you back? What's hindering your walk with God? What's hindering you from being able to walk with the Lord? You know, what's hurting your feelings? What's, What's bothering you all the time? You know, you ought to be so excited to get up to get into the presence of Jesus of Nazareth that you are more excited about getting up for that than you would be for going deer hunting if you're a man. Or Black Friday if you're a lady. Man, you see those deals and you want to get up. And We had a lady one time did that. She got 3 o'clock in the morning and went to Coles. She was going to sit there. She wanted to be there when it opened up. She sat in the parking lot waiting, you know, and she's watching that line, make sure it wasn't too bad. And she fell asleep. She woke up. Everybody had already went inside. She lost. Anyway, but uh, some people, they get so excited about uh, 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 deer season or going fishing or hunting or whatever it is or shopping that they'll get up super early just so they can go. The excitement. When was the last time you had that much excited about Jesus? Or that much love for him? That would drive you out of bed to pray, to be in your Bible, to be in the book. I'm saying this. Do something bold and drag. If there's something holding you back from doing that, uh, you need to put a, set aside a bunch of stuff in your life. There's a lot of stuff I had to put aside in my life to have a walk with him. I'm not saying you got to forever not ever do them, but don't make them the priority. That would be the second thought. No. And, and let me give you the last point real quick. We're, we're done. Number seven, and that is found in verse number 50. And here's what he says there. Verse number 50. And it says, and he... Uh, and he, casting aside his garment, rose up, and notice the last three words, came to Jesus. I like the first two words, last three words, and he came to Jesus. He came to Jesus. And what does that mean? Do it now. Do it now, the present time. Today, this instant. If you tarry till you better, there's an old song we sing. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come.
mad all. A lot of people are that way. I'm going to wait. I'm going to just tell them things are better. No, you got, just got to do it. Just do it. Just do it now. Amen? Do it now. Father God, thank you so much again for Liberty Baptist Church and Brother Rick and Miss Karen and uh, Aaron and Eric. I know they're gone today, but be with them. And Lord, thank you for this dear church. And God, their faithfulness, even in times of sicknesses. And Lord, all the people that are involved here already, people that are working the PAs and people that are working the, the screens and people involved in serving you, nurseries in every way. And just thank you for those who are so faithful to be here. Pray you bless the service this morning that we're going to start in a few minutes. God, that you'd meet our every need. And God, fill us with your love and your power. And bless in a special way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.